You know, walls are a big thing. Um, Jericho had some nice walls. A lot of us know a little bit about Jericho's walls. We know they fell down. Yeah. I looked it up, did some research on that, and they were about 13 feet high. They were backed by watchtowers and redoubts that were 28 feet high. And they were the first walls in history known to be purely for military purposes. Which is interesting. Look at all that. They, they were quite known for the military prowess. And, and Jerusalem also had nice walls until the Babylonians showed up around 587 B.C. And then they built nice walls again. And those lasted until around 70 A.D. when the Romans destroyed them, along with the temple and the city as a whole. But here's the thing. Jerusalem's walls had actually done their job many times. I suspect that Jericho's walls had done their job many times. Um, Jerusalem's walls had, done, had repelled invaders. Uh, they had, during its long history, Jerusalem had been attacked 52 times, re- captured and recaptured 44 times, besieged 23 times. And so in, the, in that, all that happening, some of those times, the walls really did work. And so the walls themselves were not the problem so much as their dependence upon the walls, because the walls could be a source of security, but they could also be a false sense of security. And that is a, that's where things kind of become a problem when they become a false sense of security, because we lean on something that isn't really secure. Some of you remember when I speak on the stand for my king, my king stands for me song stuff, so lifeline songs, we did that up at Ernest Place. Um, that uh, I talk about King Theoden in, in uh, Lord of the Rings where he is up on the, the walls of Helm's Deep and he goes to Helm's Deep because he says it's protected him before. And, of course, the orc army, they're all coming in there and, and they're doing good. They're walls, big walls. They're just shooting all bad guys down there and it's looking pretty good. And, and at one point, King Theoden's going, you know what, is this the best you can do? Is this all you can throw at us? You know, just kind of cocky. And, and then they get this bomb in there and it takes down the wall, and you see his face just go, whew. and you go, and frankly, I know that feeling, because what he was depending on, he went from, we got this, to it's over, in one moment, because his sense of security was in those walls. I was talking to them up there because, um, like most Churches that have been around a while, of course, they've been through some stuff. And uh, what we sometimes do when we've been through some stuff is we go to the things that worked in the past. Or we go to the stuff that, that seems safe and secure. When people get tired or just bored, they often put their faith in aging walls and things that are familiar, rules, rituals, routines, things that worked in the past. But the thing is, faith in the Lord is dynamic. This is about walking with the Lord. It's about being led by His Spirit. It's about Him being our strength, our shield, and our security. And the Bible is filled with admonitions to walk in the Spirit, to dwell in the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit, to have fellowship with Christ, on and on and on. And what we want to do, though, is establish certain things so that we can have, like walls around us that we think, okay, I can just go back to doing this. And maybe there are things that worked at one time. Maybe there are things that worked at one time. Man, man, the church is, is well known for, the church as a whole, is well known for continuing to do things a certain way long past their effectiveness. You can write books about it. Many people have. Just because, hey, it's the way we've always done it. There's a certain power in the way we've always done it. This is how we do things. Why? Well, because it's how we do things. Why? Because it's how we always do things. Why? Because it's how we've done things all along. And the only answer to the why often is because it's the way we've always done things. So, people love a system. People love to predictability. And Jesus pretty much always kept those around him off guard. I I found walking with Jesus to be pretty unpredictable. (laughs) In fact, the greater problems that I've gotten into in this walk with the Lord came from me second-guessing God. You know, God did this, this, and this, and let us here, here, and here. So then I go, okay, I got it. I got it. Um, I see what you're doing, Lord. I'll take it from here. 
don't really physically say that, but you just feel like it. You, you get going, and it's going in a good way. Things are working. You're moving. Everything's rolling along pretty good. And you think, hey, this is, this is it's, it's working. So you plant a church, a bunch of things you do. It just keeps going, and things are really good, and it's working, it's going, it's going. And you say, Lord, I've got it figured out now. I see what you want to do here. I've got the, a grasp of the vision. I've got a grasp of what it is you want to do. I, I've got it figured out. And so then you just start going. And then you've also worked through some things. And so in working through some things, you've developed some various policies and things that you use. And, and it's easy enough to just say, oh, we have this problem. We'll go back because it worked back like there when we did this. Back in, you know, 10 years ago, it worked when we did this. So let's do that again. And we don't necessarily say, Lord, what do you want us to do? Because now we kind of know what we're doing. Now we know what we're doing. And we do it in our individual Christian walk, too. Psalm 26 through 9 says, Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots, some in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. O Lord, save the king. May he answer when we call. The past is comfortable. It feels like safety. See, the truth of Scripture always stands. But there's a dynamic walk that we have with the Lord, and it's that walk with the Holy Spirit that shows us how to apply it in our lives and how to apply it in our ministries and how to apply it in situations and how to, how to uh, walk with the Lord. <laughs> what it really means to walk with the Lord. Look at what Jesus does here in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put your Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Now, what Jesus does here, he says it is written, and in doing so, he applies scriptural principles to a dynamic situation. There was actually no scripture saying one way or the other whether a person should turn stones into bread. But there is a scripture that says, man shall not live by bread alone. So what we see is Jesus taking scripture truth, taking truth, and applying it dynamically in a situation is what we call a principle rather than a rule. But rules are really comfortable. I'm not saying you never have rules about anything. I mean, in general, we have a rule that you shouldn't light the place on fire when you're here. It's kind of a just general thought, right? Common sense rules kind of thing. But I'm talking about the stack of rules that typically become church bylaws or, or a manual or something else that, that are, are all that we either call them standards or rules or something like this, and they become the walls that we run back to. And the older a church is, typically, the more there are. Because they've been through more situations where they had to write up a new policy. And they write up policy after policy after policy because then they have walls to run back to. And in most of the churches that I travel to and minister to and work with, even like in these recent times, that is the crippling force ahead of ministry because when you have that, the reality of being spirit-led kind of goes out the window. I don't need to be spirit-led because now I'm led by a whole bunch of policies and not principles. I'm led by a certain set of rules. I don't need to be led by the Holy Spirit. I can look up on Article 5, Section 3, what I'm supposed to do. 
And so why do I need to go to the Lord and ask him? Talked a lot at the camp about just really that intimacy with the Lord, a lot of the stuff we've talked about here. In fact, I told him at one point, I said, guys, we overcomplicate this. And I'll say to you too, uh, we overcomplicate this so much. I said, how about you're at camp right now? I said, why don't you just after the service go out and sit on a rock for 15 minutes and just say, Lord, I want to be with you. No, no, uh, God, I want to pray for my Uncle Charlie. Who's under, you can pray for Uncle Charlie. There's nothing wrong with that. But you don't have to have an agenda. Just say, Lord, I want to be with you. 15 minutes on a rock. And that was really impactful there. I thought, why is it that that's a strange thought? When we walk with the Lord, we're led by His Spirit, we are, have fellowship with Christ. Why is it a weird thought to think about just sitting on a rock for 15 minutes to just be in the presence of the Lord? Just to be with God. Not with an agenda. Just want to be with God. 15 minutes on a rock. Man, what to do is often easier to discern than when and how to do it. So it takes insight and spiritual intimacy. You know, we can know the word statistically or mechanically and certainly find some guidance there. But application, both personal and in regard to ministry to others, requires that leadership of the Holy Spirit. And that's why I tell people anywhere I go, and I think it's what kills the church up there. I think it's doing well right now. They're, they've got some new uh, direction. Um, and I think that they're in a healthy place where they could grasp this. That to honestly say, God, what do you want us to do? And it's true everywhere. It's true here. What do you want us to do? What do you want us to do? Me, personally. You. As a church, as a body. Luke 5, 36 through 39. He also tells them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on the old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old, and the one puts the new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins, and no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. The old ways of the law were clearly defined. They were. It was, it was very much when Jesus came, they had a system where, yeah, they could look at Article 5, you know, but this. Not only the law of Moses, but also many pharisaical laws that have been put into place along the way. They had a, very much a, a system of, hey, we can go back and, and check and see what we're supposed to do here. And Jesus came and said, I will write my law on your hearts. Wow, this new thing's going on. And it seems like this kind of slippery, ambiguous thing. And if you don't believe that the Holy Spirit can really lead his people, then yeah, it seems like a slippery, ambiguous thing. But it's not, because the Holy Spirit's more powerful than that. And one of the things I talked about up there is returning to the belief that Jesus can lead his people. That he can lead his people. That he can move in lives. The old ways of the law were against us, dry, lifeless rules and regulations, the written code that the Bible says was against us. I found this F.B. Meyer quote, um, and I, I liked it. Let us not cling to the broken bottle skins of the past, whether they be outworn ceremonies, creeds, or formulations of truth. Let the ferment of each great religious movement and new era express itself in its own way. We must not encourage the ill-judged speed of those who want to force the pace and fling away the bottle skins before they're done with. But if the bottle skins have evidently served their purpose and lie discarded on the ground, that will not affect the vintage which is reddening on the hills. Go and pick the fruit God is giving you, place it carefully in baskets, and let it have new skins. The fruit that God is giving you. The fruit that God is giving you. Do not put your trust in chariots or horses or men, not in your intelligence your physical resources, your politicians, your nation, your bank accounts, your relationships, your career. These things can all be walls that people run to. They can all be walls that people go, they think that's their safety, that's their security. And sometimes it's their church. That's the wall. You can just run to the church. And if that church is truly pointing them to trusting in the Lord, 
then great, great. But sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes they're telling them to trust in the church. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Now, we look at Luke 9, 28 through 33. I like this. I've used it before in this sense because I, I just think it's such a perfect example of a normal human reaction to God doing something amazing. Perfectly normal. I'm not criticizing these guys. It's exactly what I think it would happen typically if we're in a situation and God does something amazing. So he says, now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. Okay, put yourself in that for a moment. You're with Jesus and all of a sudden his face is altered and his clothing becomes dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah. Okay, at this moment, you're going, wow. Wow. Okay, we're, we're really seeing something here. And who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they came fully awake and saw his glory and the two men who stood with him, and as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said. You know, the not knowing what he said is... is, is you know, yeah, I get it. I get it. I'd felt like I needed to say something in that moment and would have probably not known anything would say. I'd, I got, um, 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 um. You know what? Let's build some statues or something, you know. This incredible thing just happened. Let's build us some statues. Let's, let's put up some buildings. Let's at least put a plaque on a tree that says this is the place where Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus and put the date on it or something, right? This could be a tourism boom or something, right? Because that's the way humans think. They want to they just kind of immortalize the, the, the event and not what really happens there of Jesus, the transfiguration, the power of that in itself. So I get it. I get it. Hey, let's build, build some tents. Let's do whatever. Let's, let's do something to mark this moment. It's just natural. Let's build a monument. But our walk with Christ is not meant to be static or focused on this world or even focused on the past. It's meant to be focused on what we're supposed to do now. What we're supposed to do now. What God wants to do in our hearts and our lives now. Not based on memories that we revere. Man, I've had some really powerful experiences with the Lord. I've had incredibly powerful experiences with the Lord. And there's always a temptation to try to recreate that. When I go into a youth camp, something like this, I can tell you of a youth camp many years ago that was one of the most powerful spiritual experiences of my entire life. It was pretty early on in our ministry, too. I haven't seen many, many times God pour out his spirit in great ways. I've never seen one like that. And yeah, every time when I go in, I think, is this going to be one? Just like last week, is this going to happen here? I hope so. But I know this, I can't recreate it. I could go in there and sing the same songs we did. I don't know what they were because it's been too long. But if I could remember, I could sing the same songs and speak the same words. And that doesn't do it. Because God chose to do something in that moment for, you know, whatever reasons, I don't know. I'm just going and being faithful to do what he asked me to do. But there's a great temptation to try to recreate it. And you know, that temptation, I don't think anybody's immune to it. When you go out there and you do this stuff every night, because the stuff we just did last week, Michelle and I used to do that for six to nine months in a year all the time. And so when you're doing two services a day, pretty much every day, and you see a certain, for instance, a certain three songs that you sing together, people really seem to get into it. You start doing those three songs together. It's just the temptation. It's like, it's like people just really seem to get excited when you do these three songs together. So let's do these three songs together. And there's a certain amount of emotion that you can manufacture, particularly through music. Um, 
and, and you to know just also if at a certain time you, you play this song and then this one that, that slows down at just the right time, you can create a certain emotional sense that's pretty powerful. And God you can use that, but you see God use it somewhere and you go, okay, I use these three songs to start and these two songs after that, and look what happens. And so it's natural to think that just because something worked at one time that God wants to do it that way all the time. And all of us have some temptation to try to second-guess God because of the way things have happened in our lives or something along that way. But our relation with him is, relationship with him has got to be fresh and not based on running back to the walls. Not based. I'm not saying there isn't a foundation. Obviously, the Word of God is our foundation. We go to this. I'm saying that the things we did, the things we were involved in, how many times have I heard people say, well, when I, our church back home, we did this and this and this. Okay, fine. Maybe that's what God wanted to do. But what about here? What about now? What does God want to do? When disaster hits and we run to our walls, what are they? What are they? I've shared with you the probably a number of times about how in reading church history, you'll see that denominations, a lot of denominations were formed out of revivals, true revivals, God moving by his Holy Spirit, things just powerful, lots of people being saved, massive moves of repentance, just the power of God moving across areas. And so groups would form and churches would form and, and it, would, it would go forward and it was, it was alive and it was powerful. And at some point, it would become somewhat dry and somewhat dead. And in every case that I have seen, and I've studied, I think, all the major denominations on this, in this context, when the thing starts to go where they're growing, growing, and they plane out, and then they start to lose membership, the answer is always the same. We need more educated pastors. Always. That's the answer. We need more educated pastors. It's, and of course, that just actually makes it go this way because they get a lot fewer fired up pastors because all they have is educated pastors with a lot of school loan bills. But, um, but honestly, why doesn't anybody look back and say, if we're going to look back, what did we have at the beginning? We had a bunch of fired up people who were being led by the Holy Spirit, who were, who were out there with a passion for Jesus. That's what we had. So why is the answer, we must need more educated pastors? And since we can look at that over and over again in history and see that it has never once worked, why does it continue to be the answer? Because it just sounds right to human beings. That's the run to the walls. That's a very typical wall just to run to it, because it seems so normal. You know, the older I get, the more I realize we're completely dependent on the Lord for wisdom and direction. One of the most beautiful things that happened in this whole trip was I'm sitting there looking at a bunch of teenagers, and I'm literally wondering, okay, I've had a break. I've been, it's been five years. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a bunch of teenagers, and I'm thinking, can I even do this anymore? You know, I mean, can I, because I don't just go in there and preach. I mean, I have to connect. So, um, you know, my whole thing, especially in a situation like that, is relational. I have to connect. I have to know their backstory. I have to, you know, I have to really have some connection. I, like to, I have to know enough to make fun of them. You know, I have to have that stuff in there. So it, uh, and so I wondered, can I still do this, right? Can I really connect? I'm an old guy now. And, uh, and, I'm, and you know, the kids before, we were, had at least some were the same ones every year. So you, we, you'd come in. This is all new. I didn't know any of these kids. And you, it could have been like one of those inspirations. The way this was set up was kind of funny. There weren't a lot of kids because they've, of course, obviously the, the last bunch of years have been uh, bad. So, because we weren't there. No, um, but also, they, um, anyway, it, this group of kids, it could have been like one of those inspirational movies like Facing the Giants or something. You know, cause I was just looking, thinking about yesterday. You had the kid who didn't want to be there, who's the cool kid. You, have, you know, you have the, the one that's, uh, you know, kind of, interesting to connect with. It was just like, this could have been an inspirational movie or something. Anyway, but you figure that out. And I need to be able to figure that out because I need to be able to relate in order to relate. And it was great. I thought, you know what? I can still connect. 
And that's the Lord. That's the Lord. Now, this is my prayer for you. It's my prayer for all of us. And just think about the depth of what Paul is saying here. I actually, this scripture, when I was working on this uh, uh, Thursday, and then, um, and then uh, Friday morning at prayer, and then it was kind of funny because I had most of this there, and, then, and Drew was praying these prayers that were like he was praying the message or something, and I was well, he just kind of prayed the message. But anyway, um, I just had this scripture that I had in here as kind of a closing, and then I was just going through it last night, and it just kept jumping out at me and jumping out at me, and I went, this could have actually been the whole message. But anyway, think about what Paul is saying. Every word matters here. In Ephesians 3, 14 through the end of the chapter. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, might have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power of work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Do you know when I get to this section in a book of the Bible and I see that he's closing something out, I'll often just read it thinking, oh, he's just closing it out. You know, he's saying, hey, guys, and blessings, salutations, and, and you know, may everybody be blessed. Man, when you actually start looking at that right there, first you go, according to the riches of his glory that he might grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being is what we're talking about here, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, which is what I'm talking about with all of the mechanical ways of thinking. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, beyond our reason, beyond our ability to to reason out, logically discern, whatever else, he's able to think, do far more far more if we are only leaning on that and what we ask or think, and that's the limit of our belief. It's a sad state. According to the power at work within us. The power at work within us. I think sometimes believers forget there's a power at work within them. At work within them. Still, it doesn't matter how long you've been a believer. It doesn't matter how much you've studied or how deep you've gone. There is still a power at work within us. Still a power at work within me. I can still go to a camp and trust that if I go to my camper and pray, God will give me what I'm supposed to say the next morning. Because there's a power at work within us. I can know that if I go sit on a rock for 15 minutes, I can just sense the Lord. I know there's a power at work within us. And I know that he is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. And I know that there he is able to, I mean, that the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, it's beyond what I can even explain to you, this love of Christ. And that according to the riches of his glory, that he can grant that I be strengthened with power through his spirit in my inner being. I want my life to be focused on the idea that, I mean, on the knowledge that there is a power at work within us. There is a power at work within us. The glory of God through the life-changing power of Jesus Christ by his Holy Spirit. The power of God surpasses all knowledge, surpasses all things. May he drive that deep into us. And may we walk around even today thinking, according to the power that was work within us. Yeah. Lord, there are so many things that Well, so many things are beyond us, Lord. They surpass our knowledge. 
And yet, God, we, we taste and see that you are good. And God, just pray that, pray as Paul prayed here for all of us, for um, God, that these things would be true in our lives. We know you are the one who is able to do abundantly more than all that we ask or think by the power at work within us and that you are the power at work within us by your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. And God, we just pray, Jesus, that you would guide us in the days ahead. I, I am guilty at times of just thinking <laughs> I'm kind of used up, Lord, and yet you still have me here, Lord. So, uh, God, I want to know. I want to know your direction, God. And I don't want to be so trapped in things that I've done for a long time a certain way that I can't hear you telling me to change. And if you don't want things to change and you want me to keep doing things this way, then I'm fine with that too, Lord. God, just whatever it is that, that you desire, I just want to know that in the center of your will and that I'm allowing your spirit to lead me and that I'm living according to the power that is at work within me. And I pray for each one here. We just give you thanks, we give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you honor in Jesus' name. Amen. And God bless. It's good to be home. <laughs>